Hello, welcome back to Growing in the Garden State. My name is Tony, and I am one of the team members that has been given the opportunity to utilize Drumthwacket, the historic governor's mansion in Princeton, as a teaching ground to help ensure that the people of New Jersey know how to grow and raise their own food. Now, in our previous episodes, we covered bed prep and getting the garden space ready. We did some spring planting. And now, as the season progresses, we've got some really great stuff growing. Now, as things grow, we may also start to learn there's pests in the garden, uh, whether it be rabbits or deer or, or insects. And so a part of this episode is going to cover how do you organically manage pests? Uh, also, as we progress, we start to think about our second successions of plantings. And, uh, and of course, the whole time we're just watching, dreaming of when do we get to eat this stuff. So anyway, thanks for watching. Let's go head over to the garden at Drumthwacket and see what's growing on. Welcome back to Drumthwacket and our ever-growing vegetable garden here. Uh, today's session is going to focus on some of just the kind of seasonal maintenance, the, the everyday kind of stuff that you want to be aware of. Um, so one of the things we're going to focus on are pests. Um, we'll also talk some about beneficial insects, but the focus will be kind of on the, the pest issues. So one of the things that you want to do really on a daily basis is to scout in your vegetable garden for uh, potential problems. And that can be noticed um, if you notice damage on your plants or if you actually notice the insects themselves. So um, here we are in our little eggplant row. And what we've noticed here, as well as on our pea crop, which is getting towards the end of its, um, of its growing season, is that we have an unexpected aphid uh, infestation. So we're going to start out by talking about some of the aphids and look at the different stages of their life as well as um, a particular parasitic wasp that may help us control this problem. So this here is an eggplant leaf and what you'll notice if you look closely is that we have a number of different, um, it's all different stages of these aphids. They're green, they, like many other pests, are very well camouflaged to their, their background, their host plant. Um, so the little white specks are actually old exoskeletons. So the aphids go through a number of different um, um, growth stages and they'll shed their exoskeleton. So those, are, those little white bits are dried out and dead. The green ones are ranging from kind of the juvenile up through adult stages. What's really cool here is that these brown ones that look kind of swollen, those are aphids that have actually been parasitized by a, per, a particular parasitic wasp that will literally lay its eggs inside the aphid and then it kind of balloons out like this. So the brown ones are no longer a threat to the plant. They're no longer feeding. However, the green ones are still problematic. Um, at, if you just have a few, um, my best recommendation is just to, to wipe them off with a, a thumb. So just kind of squishing them off. They, they squish pretty easily. They're not very hard shelled. Um, but in a case like this, where you have a lot, uh, we would probably recommend using an insecticidal spray um, which there are a number of different uh, organic ones you'll want to look for one that is OMRI approved so that uh, so that you're following good organic practices um, there are a number of other kind of home remedies that you can use um, but using an insecticidal soap is going to be your best bet options for that you'll want to look on the label it'll say OMRI um, which stands for the Organic Materials Review Institute. Um, so that is a substance uh, that has been approved and is, um, is tested to be very safe for both you and, uh, and your garden, as well as other, um, other animals, um, like your pets. Um, so you'll want to, anytime you uh, use a spray in the garden, so if you're applying a, a liquid spray to your, your foliage, You'll want to do that as early in the morning as possible. 
um, because you run the risk of burning the leaves once the sun comes out. So you wanna make sure you do that. Um, an overcast day is great for it, um, but also paying attention to the weather so that you're not spraying right before a big rainstorm because the rain, of course, will just wash all of that um, topical treatment right off. So here we have a very early stage of the European cabbage worm. Um, which we might get some footage of the uh, adult moth. Um, it's a little uh, kind of pale yellow to whitish moth, but you'll notice that we have some little eating patterns in here. So as soon as you see uh, eating patterns on any of your leaves, they're particularly fond of the kale crops, right? So the brassicas, you'll want to start looking for these worms. Typically, they're very well camouflaged to the foliage, so you'll want to look closely. And my favorite method for worm control uh, okay. that doesn't involve <laughs> spraying something like VT, which we'll talk about later, um, is just to smush them. You can use gloves if you want, um, but they're not particularly messy. We, uh, we have a couple of choices when it comes to weeds. We can hand pull them, and if it's a very small area, that might work effectively. But if you have anything a little bit larger, uh, I highly suggest a cultivating tool. This is a cultivating hoe. It's particularly one is called a swan neck because it's uh, shaped like a swan. Some of them call them half moon hoes. Um, but it's, it's a little different than a chopping hoe. What do I call a chopping hoe? Because it's not meant to chop like like uh like that it's meant to slide along the surface of the soil and if i hold this correctly with my back straight and my thumb up that surface is flat on the ground so as i pull it through the soil it is cutting any weed that may be in there and it's going to lay on the surface of the soil for a few hours on especially if i can do it on a sunny morning uh, and it's going to be dead uh, before you know it I like this particular hoe because as you see, it's got a kind of a sharp point on the end. I can get right up to my, my little radishes here. And you know, once in a while I may hit one. Um, it, it happens to everybody, but basically I can get very close. There are other versions of this, which uh, I think they call them stirrup hoes. You'll see it looks like a, a, a stirrup that you uh, used to ride a horse. And they're effective also. I like this one a little bit better because again, I can get right up close to the plant where the stirrup hoe, if you're uh, uh, cultivating, uh, weeding, uh, say lettuce plants that have leaves that will, will drop over under the ground. You can't really get underneath those leaves. Where well, this one is very effective. It's more expensive and I don't know that it's available um, locally. Uh, if, you, if you Google uh, swan neck hoe, uh, you'll find several places on the internet that sell them. And uh, it is more expensive, but uh, this one's 25 years old. It's you know perfectly new. I uh, don't really have to keep it very sharp. I probably have sharpened it a few times, but very effective. Now, um, if you get a smaller area, and that sounds like a big investment, uh, I think Ariana is going to show us how to use another one of these uh, cultivating hoes, which is uh, hand hoe, and uh, you know quite a bit less expensive and. Um, uh, you know, but it can be just as effective on a small area. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is succession planting. And what succession planting is, is it's a way of planting that gives you a harvest throughout the whole year and throughout the whole season without coming to such a big uh, harvest that you can't use all your food and it goes to waste. And there are two way, two main ways of doing that. So one way is we have so for instance we have greens here and you can see that as it gets really hot these greens start to go to seed they start to flower and once they start to flower they the leaves really become they start getting quite bitter and a bit tough there and they're no longer as tender and sweet so this set of greens has had two cuttings two full cuttings and this is coming up to the third but you can see by the third it starts getting really hot you they're starting to flower and you're not really gonna get a fourth before it gets too hot and they start flowering, trying to go to seed and they get bitter. So one way of succession planting is to put another plant that's going to be a bit slower or come in better in a later season right next to it. So here we've got beans. 
with the beans, as the beans grow up, they'll bush out and they'll cover some of this space. As we mentioned before, you really don't want your ground to ever be completely bare. That's how you get weeds. So these beans will grow in and fill in this space that you've taken the greens out of. And you can continue to do that. So on this side, you've got beets and peas and beans and those things, again, as the peas get too hot and have to come out, the beets will grow and fill in that space and you're continually getting food. That's one way of succession planting. Another way is to simply plant things like carrots, radishes, beans, beets, plant them maybe one, however much your family's going to eat in two weeks, plant that amount. Don't waste all your seeds and then have, you know, 50 beets coming in to, that you can't eat it fast enough. So you plant just enough for two weeks. Two weeks later, you come in and you plant another two weeks worth of seed and you continue to do that throughout the season. And, and carrots, beets, beans, greens are all excellent for that kind of succession planting. And then you won't waste your seed and you won't have so much food at the end of the season that you simply can't use it all. And you've now wasted it or you're trying to preserve it and it's fun to preserve food, but no one ha wants to have to do it. Let's move on to the zucchini. One of the things that we planted earlier in the year was pumpkins and squash. So in this row of pumpkins, let's see which one this actually, ooh, and there's cicadas. I just can't do the cicadas. Um, this one was uh, a pie squash and they didn't actually make it. So if you find that you're getting to a season where some of the plants are coming up, and some have not made it, you want to go back straight away and reseed those areas so that you don't waste that space and you still get some harvest in. So we're actually just going to put um, about three seeds in each of these two hills. And it's not really difficult. With squash, you want to go about an inch down. So what I do is I generally say, uh, to basically to your mid-knuckle on the average person, and we're just going to pop three down, space them apart a decent, maybe about three or four inches in one hill. And we're just gonna pop that down in there up to about the knuckle and just cover it right up and we'll come back and water that. And we'll do this one as well. You could, you, you know, there are lots of tools that measure out exactly how deep but I'll tell you the truth I don't always do that sometimes you want to just get it in so that it starts to produce rather than waiting to buy a tool and all of that sometimes you just get it in the ground so this is our three sisters garden and a three sisters garden is a Native American concept of granting uh, of growing and interplanting certain things together so that they work together naturally so here we've got corn and beans, and of course we have our squash over there. So in a traditional three sisters garden, you would have your squash right in with your corn and beans. And the reason for that is that as the corn grows up, you can either have a trellis like this, or you can use the corn for the beans to grow up as a trellis. So the corn will grow up, the beans will grow up the corn as a trellis, and then the squash tends to spread out which will keep the, cool, the ground cool and keep the weeds down from interfering with the peas and the corn. So this is another way of succession planting because your beans and your corn and then your squash or pumpkins are going to be ready to harvest at very different times. And that's another way to let nature work with itself and look after itself and make sure work a bit easier. So here we are with one of my absolute favorite things to grow, and that's garlic. So this time of year, your garlic should be growing, going through, having been planted in the fall here in zone 6B. The garlic will be about coming up two feet high. You'll have what's called scapes just starting to grow. We'll talk about that. And with the weeding, you just want to go in and very gently pull out the weeds because you don't want to disturb the bulb being that garlic, the main part of the garlic that you want is in the ground. So very gentle with the weeding. Um, and we want them to just grow as best they can. But 
one of the things I wanted to talk about is that this time of year, you'll start seeing what's called scapes. And we've got a couple in here. So this is a garlic scape. And what will happen is that as this grows, this little bud here will become what a flower. It'll open up like a flower. And so many people will come in and just cut it off. And I'll do that here. You can pinch it off, you, but a clean cut is usually better. But if you've got a massive amount of them, you really can go in and just snap these off. And these are wonderful for eating. You can chop them, put them in stir fries. They smell, oh my goodness. They smell amazing. <laughs> it smells like I'm in an Asian restaurant. It's just, they're fantastic. Um, but the reason I don't always cut them off is because when this flowers behind it is what's called bubbles at the end of the season if you leave this scape on a lot of the energy from the plant goes into flowering and preparing for seed although it's not technically seed because it's a, a copy of the actual garlic but it begins to flower rather than the energy going into the bulb so if you leave the scapes on you're going to reduce your garlic bulb size, your head size, um, in lieu of getting the scapes. So if you want larger bulbs and you're not thinking about producing lots of garlic later on and you're not patient, which many of us are not, you can just cut this off, use it. The energy will go back to the bulb. However, if you're like me and you're a seriously patient gardener, when this blooms behind it will come what's called bubbles. And you can get one to 200 bubbles in each scape. Bubbles look like teeny tiny little cloves. And you can turn around and hold on to those once everything dries, you want it to completely dry. Um, and you wanna cut them off before they fall off into the ground or you'll have garlic the following year, which is fine, but I like to strategically plant mine where I want it to go. So if you take those bubbles and plant them in the fall, you're gonna get marble sized cloves about this big the following year. And then you do the same thing, you let those grow, you take the scapes off of those if there are any, and then in the fall, the following year, you plant them again. So if you've gotten one to 200 bubbles from the first scape, and you plant those bubbles, now you have one to two, 100 to 200 small cloves once you plant them for the following year. The year after that, you then turn around and you replant those marble-sized cloves and they become full heads of garlic. So this process takes about two years, um, two to three seasons. So you have to be patient, but just think if you're gonna get one to 200 garlic heads from just one scape, if you're patient. So sometimes what you can do is take the scapes off of most of your hard neck garlic because only hard neck have scapes, not soft. And then you, you leave just a few to get the bubbles. And at that point, if you're patient, you'll probably never have to buy garlic again. So one more thing, deer don't like garlic. So when you're trying to protect your plants from deer, a lot of times things like garlic and potatoes are generally not things that deer tend to go after so you can put them outside of your protected area because they smell so amazing deer actually don't like them and that is fantastic okay well thanks i hope you are all absorbing some really great information and are really excited about your garden and we are so thrilled that you are tuning in with us and being a part of this. So if you'd like any more information and maybe there's a little bit more that you need that we haven't covered, check us out online. Go to nofanj.org. All sorts of information and other connection points that you can make through there. And we are a community of people that are so passionate about growing and helping others. So don't hesitate, reach out, and we'd love to hear from you. So again, nofanj.org and we will see you next time.